Hi everyone. Uh, so this is the WC2 and API Fortress joint webinar, and we'll be talking about the best practices for productizing APIs today. Uh, we'll be focusing on the best practices, lessons learned over time, lessons learned uh, over a thousand plus customer engagements, and then we'll also be focusing on security, the API security part of things, and the API testing part of things. Uh, so a few housekeeping rules as well uh, while we go through this webinar. Uh, so this is GoToWebinar. So if you s look at your GoToWebinar uh, tab, you can see a questions panel there. If you have any questions, please feel free to type out any questions there. And uh, either during the session or at the end of the session, we'll look at the questions and, and respond to those questions either through the webinar itself or we'll type the responses out uh, there. Uh, in terms of the slides and the recordings, we'll make these available to you within 24 hours. Uh, so basically, we'll share the slides as well as the recordings and we'll jointly package them together as well. Uh, so so uh, yeah, you can look forward to that as well. Uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon from wherever you are in the world. Uh, these are interesting times. Uh, all of us are at home, so if you see my video uh, and if you see kids running around, don't mind me. Um, on the call today, we basically have uh, Patrick Pullin, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of API Fortress. Uh, I'll let Patrick go uh, next. Uh, firstly, so my, uh, my name is Mifan Curry. I'm the Vice President of Solutions Architecture at WSO2. Uh, I'm responsible for working with the, the technology customers at WSO2. And uh, myself and my team have worked on like thousand plus integration and API projects. So whatever we are talking about today is basically a, a collaborative uh, experience uh, that we are basically uh, presenting. Uh, I'm based out of uh, New York, uh, and uh, yeah, and then that's basically it. Uh, Patrick, do you want to say a few words? Push the wrong button. Yep, yeah, I'm Patrick Bourne, co-founder of API Fortress. Started around five years ago, and uh, it's, a, it's been an interesting evolution of API testing for what it once was, very sort of manual to a much more automated, and now with CICD. Just last five years, a, a shift to CICD has really changed a lot, and so that's one of the things I'm gonna dive into, is sort of like the meshing of the CICD and monitoring world. But uh, you're off first, Mo, fun. All right, thanks, thanks Patrick. So as as we uh, as we spoke about, like the title of today's talk is the best practices for productizing APIs, right? And that of course needs to start with what a product is and what makes a good product. Uh, so before jumping into API products, uh, if you look at any good product, any sustainable product, any product that is marketed well, or even any bad product, you can see a few key characteristics. And there are different definitions of what these characteristics are. There's the different C's, the different P's, so on and so forth. But I've just picked a few of these, right? So starting with the usability, right? A product has to be usable. That means it has to be understandable. It has to be learnable. It has to be consistent. Uh, if you are in a specific region, uh, that product needs to be localized to your specific regional requirements. So in essence, usability is, of course, relative. It, it depends on what usability means to you as a as a user as a consumer but at the end of the day the product has to be usable by you right uh, the product has to be desirable as well right so so that means it whilst it's usable uh, there is also the factor of the product being desired in the market right uh, there, for certain types of products there is the aesthetic value of the product for certain types of products there's the emotional value of the product uh, the product might be an inventive version of something that's already out there, right? So let's say there's been a certain product or a certain need for some time, and then a new company comes up with a with something that's that's a bit different, that's a bit intuitive, that's a bit inventive, right? Uh, and the product has to be uh, desirable as a whole, right? So it's not just a product that's usable, but there needs to be a definite need out there. There needs to be a definite desire out there for that specific product. A product has to have utility, right? So, so that means a product will have a certain purpose. Uh, it satisfies a customer need, and it can be maybe it can be like a, a technological, uh, a genuine product or a, a in in genuine product, uh, basically from a technology perspective. But it has to have 
that specific utility, uh, that specific need that it fits into. Uh, a product has to, of course, be reliable, right? So when it comes to standard products, uh, a product that long is, is that, that's a long lived product, uh, the mean time between failures is quite low. Uh, it should be tolerant to edge cases, right? So outside cases or, or cases that are not the norm, not the happy part. Uh, it should be tolerant to like external pressures, external conditions, etc. Uh, a product has to be efficient, of course. Uh, so, so you can't have this light bulb picture which takes up like uh, a quite a large amount of energy. Right? So, a product has to be efficient. It has to be fast. It has to be available. It has to be highly performant. It has to be. Uh, it has to work within that specific context. And, and also a product has to be intuitive as well, right? You cannot spend a month trying to learn a very simple product. Of course, for a complex product, yeah, you, you might have to spend a month, but it has to be intuitive. And, and this, of course, can clearly be mapped into uh, APIs and, and digital products as well, right? Even when it comes to digital products, the products have to be much, much more efficient. They have to be quite intuitive. Uh, they have to have a specific utility. They have to be reliable. There needs to be a specific desire for those products and they have to be usable, right? So today's products and, and the, the one of the focus or the main themes of this webinar is that APIs are the products of the 21st century. And, and what do we really mean by this, right? So if you look at different, the, the newer generation of unicorns, the newer generation of companies like, let's say, Stripe, who, who build payment APIs or, or Twilio who build communication APIs. You can see one factor there, and, and that is basically the focus or the onus is on building the right product in the right way for the right markets uh, with the right utility, so on and so forth. Right? So, so basically APIs are the product of the 21st century. And even if you think of your, your productization model as a digital supply chain, right, where you have integrations to backend systems, uh, you have your your supply chains where you you uh, you connect to various cloud systems. Uh, you do your transformations. You write your services. You then basically design APIs around this. You define very specific SLAs and interfaces, and then you let your northbound partners, your your customers, your third party developers to access these APIs in a secure format. Right. So that's basically you productizing those APIs. And the consumer of those APIs can be internal, they can be external, they can be partners, they can be B2B. But at the end of the day, you are basically picking a certain user group and productizing those APIs, right? So that's that's basically the focus, and, and that's what we are seeing uh, globally today as well. And one good way of looking at this is to look at APIs as something that encapsulates value. Uh, and and there, there are there are few uh, few concepts uh, here as well. So let me just refresh my screen a bit. I'm going to do a a quick Murphy's law example uh, to show you that my screen hasn't been refreshed. Okay, let me share that again. Go full screen. Again. All right. So, so basically, APIs encapsulate value, and and this is a good way of thinking about products. Right? So, so for this, the first point here uh, is basically APIs are how digital value is delivered. So, let's say you have an organization where you you invest in data. Right? So, you have terabytes of data. Let's say you are a telco, uh, or you are a mapping company, and you have like uh, uh, terabytes and petabytes of, of spatial data. And, and basically you expose that those data or that data element in a secured format via APIs. So you are basically uh, exposing digital value. And this digital value can then be monetized. Either you can directly monetize them, you have a, a payment methodology, you have a revenue share model, you have a freemium model, et cetera, or there is some level of indirect monetization. Like let's say, another business unit within your organization uses those APIs and there's an indirect way of monetizing and of course to monetize you you need to be able to track the APIs uh, you need to be able to uh, keep keep track of what the key results of the APIs are what the key performance indicators are you need to be able to observe the APIs etc and these APIs can be traded they can be marketed similar to a, a normal product 
right? So you expose the APIs to a specific B2B customer, uh, or you market those APIs as a Stripe API, a payment API, and, and you try to get more customers onboarded onto those APIs. Customer onboarding is a, a, an increasingly important aspect and facet of this as well. So those APIs are intermediated, they are traded, they are marketed, not just between the, the organizations, not just between your partners and, and your customers and third party developers, but within your organization as well, be it different business units, different functional units, or even different development teams. So if you come to think of it, there are three aspects here. Right? So technology assets have to be built for reuse, right? So they, you have to basically build technology assets. The new assets need to be built for reuse. The existing assets, you need to see how you can reuse them to improve efficiency. And when you reuse, that compounds your uh, return on technology investments, similar to like compound interest rates, right? So you're basically reusing and you reuse on top of that and you reuse on top of that, right? So you are compounding that. So what that means is you are encapsulating your intellectual property. Your intellectual property is your digital value and you are encapsulating your intellectual property and you are encapsulating your value. And that's a good way of basically thinking about how uh, APIs uh, play into the picture. That brings us to uh, one of the, the main agendas of this topic, which is a tenet, the tenets of API products. Again, there are different variations of this. There are different uh, articles about like what is important when it comes to an API product. Uh, this is basically my view on, on this, and this is based on uh, the different uh, experiences that we've had or I've had uh, working with customers. And then I'll go through some of these areas. And Patrick will go through very specifically some of these areas as well in much more uh, detail. Uh, so API strategy, of course, you start with API strategy, you start with the why of the APIs, you move on to the design of the APIs, like how do you design a good API? Uh, is that API discoverable? Is that API intuitive? All of the factors of uh, product that we looked at. Right? Uh, you basically then go on to implementing the API or implementing the service or actually looking at the implementation of the API. These can be interchangeable. Right? You can start with your service and then start looking at how to expose the business API, or you can start with the business API and then start looking at how to implement that actual API. Again, interchangeable. So this is not really a, a, a waterfall diagram. This is just like circles around a bigger circle. Think of it that way. Uh, so security is part and parcel and a core concept when it comes to APIs, especially when you start exposing these APIs, uh, regardless of whether that's an internal exposure of the APIs or whether you're exposing it to just partners over VPN or whether you're exposing it to end users. Uh, so, so security is a core component and security has to be inbuilt. You have to have a security first or privacy by design concept. Documentation is key. People need to be able to understand the API. It needs to be intuitive enough, but you also need to be able to onboard quickly onto the system. Uh, testing, Patrick will be talking about this. Similar to any testing, whether it, whether it is a product testing, whether it's quality assurance of a, of a product, whether it's to figure out what the mean time between failures are of a specific product, whether it's to figure out whether the, this product is available at any given time or whether it can handle the load or, or uh, or the requests coming in or the edge cases coming in uh, or where they can handle like edge security cases. Uh, testing is key and then that's very critical even when it comes to your API products. Uh, you need to be able to observe the products. Uh, so observability covers here different aspects. It covers monetization. Uh, it covers uh, so basically uh, the monitoring of the product the business analytics of the product, uh, the actual underlying agents that observe the product and, and look at your OKRs and your key performance indicators, etc. Uh, you need a continuous deployment, continuous integration model around any product. And, and that's, that's doubly true for API products as well. Uh, monetization, uh, again, this can be direct or indirect monetization. Uh, we'll look at that in, in, in a bit. And then of course, feedback loop and change is quite important as well. As with any good product, you need to have a model where you can get continuous feedback. You can share beta versions of this for uh, sample users to test out, and you need to have a mechanism of continuously improving this. Right? So I'm going to cover some areas and, and then basically 
uh, Patrick will cover some of the areas as well. So jumping on to one aspect. So that's basically the strategy part of uh, the tenants, right? So if you look at the strategy part of tenants, the, the core question to ask is why you need an API. What's your basic, what's your goal basically uh, to, to, respond, uh, to expose these APIs? And, and whether they are, they are system APIs, whether they are just to streamline internal assets or whether it's like actual business APIs. Uh, what I've seen is like two major categories of why APIs are exposed. And, and this diagram, if you look at this diagram as well uh, from, from uh, Kata Consortium with Wipro, uh, there are different key drivers behind creating APIs. Uh, but if you look at it at an overall level, you either want to streamline your internal assets. Right? So, so you want to basically take your internal assets, promote reuse. Again, remember the, the concept of uh, encapsulating intellectual property. So you want to promote reuse. Or you want to basically take those existing uh, services and, and create an environment of innovation. Right? So, so let's say you have petabytes of data. You want to take that data, expose it as APIs in a control manner to your internal organization or to your external uh, organi or external to your organization and see what sort of creative business models come up based on that uh, similar model with uh, the Stripe and Twilio use cases. There are a number of creative businesses that are built on top of Twilio. Uh, I, I worked with a telco company which basically started exposing their telco data, such as uh, direct operator billing, uh, location-based services, uh, so on and so forth. So once they started exposing the telco data, which was very proprietary to a telco in the past, so once you start exposing those data, they then got multinational companies and, and universities and startups to basically use those APIs to build innovative applications on top of that. Once that happens, you can have a, a revenue share model or some kind of a monetization model where you share in the success of, of that endeavor. Right? So that's basically an example of innovating using existing uh, information, existing data. Uh, the facade model is also quite interesting. So let's say you have a, a legacy system, you have a mainframe system, uh, you, you've got like certain set of skill sets and people with certain skill sets who are required to program those mainframe systems. And, and one, one aspect we've seen is customers trying to facade or create a facade or wrapper around those legacy systems and expose them as APIs so that now you can get a newer breed of uh, developers or, or programmers to now basically write applications that uses, use those uh, backend systems, the, the mainframes, et cetera. So the facade model is also an interesting motivator for uh, create, creating APIs, but all of them, fall under streamlining internal assets in some form or the other, and then trying to monetize those internal assets. Another approach, another larger component is also basically trying to get newer channels, better reach, or newer customer reach. It's, for example, you have your data, you have your web application, you want to very quickly create your mobile application uh, within like weeks, not months, right? So if you have the right APIs in a reusable manner, then that, that makes it that much more simpler, where you can just focus on the, the problem at hand instead of actually looking at what the underlying uh, data uh, exposure problem is. Right? So, so this can be exposing APIs to your business to business uh, or business to consumer channels, uh, looking at very specifically partners and exposing data in a secure manner to partners, uh, trying to solve the age-old problem of files being FTP'd across for, for certain requirements, uh, basically creating newer channels like web and mobile and kiosks and digital banking and, and digital telcos and so on and so forth. Right? And then, of course, also opening these up to third-party developers wherever possible so that you actually uh, encourage innovation and, and creativity outside. And then, of course, that will basically help the organization itself. Right? So the strategy part is the most important part of creating an API. You need to get the why correct. It shouldn't be just that you want to follow buzzwords and create an API. You need to have an exact goal and figure out why uh, the organization needs APIs. And that can be an iterative process as well. You start small, you, you expose internally, and then you figure out which parts to expose externally. But as part of this, uh, you also need to track 
this as well. You you need to know what your strategy is. It can be divided into a basically your your strategic part of stuff, your tactical uh, part of stuff, and you need to be able to map against that strategy. So, for example, if you are planning to expose this to like uh, and uh, partners, okay, how many partners do you want to expose this to? What's the timeline you want uh, this exposure to happen during? And and then basically, how many partners do you want to onboard? What's the kind of revenue and uh, revenue sharing model you're looking at within a six months period of time? So, objectives and key results is a good way to track this. Or basically, you need to look at key performance indicators. But strategy is not just the, uh, having a strategy for the sake of having it. Right. You need to be able to have a clear strategy, a clear tactical statement, and then basically be able to map to that tactical statement. And of course, change uh, your, your tactical strategy if things are not working. API design uh, is, a, is another key area. And the, the, this, the design part goes into what you're trying to design, how you're planning to design your API, whether you're planning to use like, specific technologies to expose the APIs, but they are planning to use uh, open API specifications, Swagger 3.0, Swagger 2.0, uh, RAML, so on and so forth. Right. So there's different different uh, things to look at. Uh, there is of course the Bezos mandate uh, back in the day when. Uh, so I've just just uh, pasted that there for your reference, where the organization basically came and said that everything needs to be exposed as APIs, and, and that's a really good top down approach where you say okay. This is our executive order. Everything needs to be exposed as APIs. Or let's say there, there's a recent healthcare compliance requirement in the US where, where all patient data needs to be exposed as uh, FHIR compliant APIs. There was a there was an open banking compliance requirement in, in uh, Europe a couple of years back, right? And which is still ongoing in different parts of the world where APIs need to be compliant with the PSD2 regulations and, and the, the local regulations in each region. So regulatory requirement, executive requirements, top-down requirements is a good way of ensuring the organization uh, follows the API bandwagon. Right? There is also the bottom-up requirement as well, right? the bottom-up uh, approach where, where developers, where the architects, where the actual service implementing teams look at the requirement, they start building services, then you figure out that you need the certain SLAs and quality of service around these API, uh, services and those becomes APIs. And, and those APIs, they need to be discoverable, they need to be monetized, so on and so forth as well, right? Uh, but when it comes to API design, uh, we, we see uh, domain-driven design taking off as, as well. Uh, basically, you look at your domains, you look at your business requirements first, and then figure out what that exact business requirement is, and then try to see what API will satisfy that business requirement. And then that cannot be tied to a single channel as well. You cannot say that this business requirement is only a web business requirement. You need to develop this as, that as a generic requirement so that in the future you can keep adding channels. Even if you take a product, a product should be able to evolve, right? It should be able to handle different tenets of the future or future requirements. And, and with an API, that should be the same as well. So domain-driven uh, design is basically a key component of API design as well. So let, now you have your strategy, you designed your API, you need to have documentation around the API as well. Right? So, so when it comes to uh, documentation around the API, uh, basically you need to look at who the users are in, in this case. So an API is most often co uh, consumed by an application developer or a service developer, uh, again. Right? So someone who wants to create an application or a service consuming those APIs. Right? So that's one type of actor. And the, the one of the major tools to do this with is, is a developer portal. Right? So this is just an example of the Hilton API developer hub, which is a public uh, API portal. Right? So, so the developer portal allows you to publish all of your APIs. So, you, so that as an API developer, as an API business owner, you can publish your APIs. You publish the, the documentation that are relevant to that APIs. You basically need to invest in the documentation as well. So similar to any product documentation, your API documentation needs to be in, intuitive. It needs to be clear. It needs to be user focused. You need to focus on the user experience side of things as well. And there's different technologies again. You can use the Swagger Open API specification. Uh, there's Markdown specification that is coming up now. So different technologies, different tools, but the investment into documentation 
is is a critical uh, component. Uh, the next step is monetization, right? So again, monetization might not be your strategy on day one. It might be like, let's say a two year strategy where you start with your APIs, you see whether they, it achieves its OKRs and KPIs, you see whether it is successful, and then you basically move on to uh, your monetization of the APIs. Right? Uh, again, this is from Programmable Web, uh, and, and it gives a good overview model of monetization. But if you go back to our concept again, that APIs encapsulate intellectual property, right? And that technology assets have, uh, have to be built for reuse, and then APIs promote that value. So there are different ways of looking at it, right? From left to right. The API is the product, and that's what we are looking at here as well. Right? So AWS and Skype and stuff like that, where API is the product, that's your main source of revenue, right? And then your, your second part is API projects the product. So you have a product and APIs basically uh, encapsulate that product and help extend that product much more, right? So if you look at the eBay model, right? so you have APIs and people can publish into eBay quite easily from their own ecosystems. And that's only possible because uh, it's API driven. Uh, API promotes the product as well. So there's an API promotion part of your product where you have different channels now. So instead of just the TV, now you have a kiosk, you have a, a web channel, you have a mobile channel, and channels are added daily as well because it's that much easier because you already have the underlying business APIs. And then of course, API powers the product, right? So, so basically it's, it's uh, uh, extending the product as well. As with any good product, Again, feedback loop and change is inevitable. You cannot have a product where you, you assume that you've covered all the bases, where you figured out that these are the set of requirements, this is the product I'm going to build, and then that product is good for one or two years, and it can uh, cater to all of the requirements. APIs need to be treated similar to any product, which means there needs to be a good feedback loop and change management process to handle the feedback that comes in. Uh, this is a diagram of, of uh, David Sachs. Uh, basically, on that's the famous napkin diagram, right? When it came to uh, how Uber's business model works, right? it's it's a continuous feedback loop business model where, let's say, if you have more demand, you need more drivers. If there's less demand, you have you need more uh, riders so that more drivers come out. And then the financial model continuously changes as well. And this needs to be possible with the API ecosystem as well. Right? So for example, when you're going to publish an API, you design the API, you can publish a, a prototype version of the API, and there'll be, let's say, a beta set of users who have access to the prototype APIs, and they can test the prototype APIs and give feedback via forums. And, and once this feedback is received, the API team needs to be able to change the product or change the API or create newer versions of the API. That means the API uh, management system needs to support a versioning strategy as well. But feedback loops, critical, super important uh, when it comes to good API products. Versioning, again, touching upon the previous uh, concept of feedback loops. So, so you, have, you need a system or you need the underlying framework or the tool that can support API versioning as well. So similar to any product version, right? So you've got the iPhone, X and now you've got the iPhone 11 and iPhone 12 and whatever is going to come out. Right? So APIs are super critical as well because what you need to understand is there are actual businesses or actual applications that are built on top of the API. So if you cannot just go and change an API because you have to take care of those businesses out there. So there, you, there needs to be careful thought into how you version an API, how you deprecate an API, how you change an API. Most API management systems like WS2 have a, a versioning system where you can create new versions of APIs. You can selectively deprecate previous versions of APIs by looking at the num number of subscribers uh, as part of that API, uh, so on and so forth. And even when it comes to versioning, there are multiple versioning strategies. You have the, uh, you basically have the major minor patch version strategy as well, which is which is quite uh, popular as well, right? So. For breakable changes, you have a major version, uh, but then even with major versions, that shouldn't break the existing applications. So any new users who come into the developer portal can come and see the newer version of the APIs and subscribe to them. 
but older users can continuously use the older versions of APIs. And when you're naming these versions, you can figure out like what sem or semantic versioning strategy you want to use as well. But again, the underlying tool needs to support all of these uh, capabilities. Uh, when it comes to development, right? so, so development was one of the tenets of API uh, product design. And, and that means you basically need to need to look at the bigger picture, right? So you you basically develop your APIs, you develop your interfaces in certain languages like Open API specification. You would develop your uh, actual implementation, maybe in Java or .NET or, or Ballerina or, or any or Spring Boot or any other underlying language, uh, basically. But but then you also need a runtime for this to run, right? And and this picture. Is just a bird's eye view of, of the different actors, the different components, the different business components and technology components that a typical API platform would support, a typical full lifecycle API management support platform. Just quickly running through this, on the left hand side, you see you have API developers uh, who are the people who actually create the business APIs. These uh, these group of actors can be different from the actual API implementation developers or the service developers, or they can be the same actors. Uh, they take on a publisher role. They can create the API and you can have someone else uh, take the business respons responsibility of publishing the API, or it can be the same person. This can be a fully automated task uh, with automated governance, or it can be uh, basically uh, a manual task through a portal as well. Uh, similarly, you see on the left hand side uh, below the dev API developer, you have the application developer. We call that the app developer here. Uh, so these application developers need to be onboarded onto the system. Uh, they need to subscribe to specific APIs. Uh, you can have specific workflows associated with this. Like for example, if they need, if it's a premium API and if they need to pay for that API, they need to go through a paywall or firewall to get through that API. If they, are a, if they are a partner of the organization, let's say partner of the bank, they need to be onboarded and there are workflows associated with that. There's discovery, there's documentation, there's SDKs, there's security, all associated with the developer portal side of things. If you look at the right-hand side of the diagram, you have supportive components like the key manager for security, traffic manager for rate limiting and throttling, uh, observability components like real-time analytics and batch analytics, and then you have the core or the crux of the system, which is the gateway or micro gateways or any type of runtime. And the API consumers hit that runtime. And that's where the security, the SLA checks, the, the privacy checks, all of that basically uh, takes place it, it, before passing on to the backend system. Uh, so, but then there's one other aspect to think of as well. So when we spoke about the tenets of an API product, we spoke about the API product itself, but there are also aspects that come from the platform that product sits in. Right? And one of the key components is sustainability. So an API needs to be sustainable and the platform needs to be sustainable. Right? So, so which means that you have a marketplace of users continuously developing APIs, continuously consuming APIs and building applications, doing training and evangelization around those APIs, uh, building business models around these APIs and applications, so on and so forth. Uh, you need the governance aspect to come in to ensure that the right APIs are exposed in the right format to the right users, right? And, and continuous change, continuous monetization. But you also need the concept of uh, network effects and platforms provide this. Right? So, so basically, if you take a, a successful platform like Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb, and so on and so forth, uh, you look at you you can see the underlying effects there, right? So you have some assets; those assets are exposed, but then you also ensure that there is a continuous feedback loop to uh, to to encourage people to continuously publish assets, to continuously use those assets and build applications, to continuously build uh, business models around these applications. And that brings us to the next. Uh, and, and final stage, which is basically the marketplace as a platform. So API management platforms are not just a technology uh, tool or technology platform, but they are much wider than that. They, they basically are the implementation of your strategy. They are the implementation of your network effect that your organization is trying to achieve. So in addition 
to that runtime components and in addition to the uh, technology components like security and observability etc you also have the concepts of the consumers uh, so they can be partners internal external developers they can be systems and things in an iot space you have the producers who will be the api designer, designers the business api uh, designers and owners different systems as well in an automated manner uh, you have the activities on the left which is like the workshops the hackathons the evangelism etc which is critical to make a sustainable and successful api platform and this is where most of the organizations fail by not focusing on that left hand side of things so it's not just good enough to focus on the technology side but you need to look at it from a business side and a sustainability uh, angle as well and and if you look at metcalf's law right so so it, which says that the effect of the network is proportional to square of the number of connected users that's a mouthful i had to read that off the screen but but think about it that's that's a critical thing and if your organization is heading in that direction that is a, a key aspect to look at so so basically what we really looked at is the tenets of uh, and a good api product uh, if you remember that circle diagram up there uh, there were 10 tenets there and we looked at a few of them in detail but then api product uh, features and characteristics don't just stop with the product but it also goes into the underlying api management platform so the platform you use needs to have the right capabilities the right tool sets the right futuristic vision to be able to scale accordingly according to your business requirements for example if you need to deploy this on the cloud or you deploy this on a kubernetes infrastructure uh, you need to re rely on the underlying platform to do that the platform needs to be able to scale to be able to do that so i've left out a few key aspects uh, such as api security and testing which is a again super super critical uh, and i'll let uh, patrick who is much more qualified than me to talk about those aspects uh, so patrick i'll leave this over to you and uh, sorry let me stop sharing my screen here so that uh, you can start sharing your screen so try to figure out how to do this i believe in you we all yeah. believe in you. <laughs> all right okay. center uh, all right so i am going all right, to okay. go i think this should work Does that work yes absolutely it's working all right perfect Cool. So I'm Patrick, as we said earlier. Uh, so what's been interesting, and this is something that happens a lot when we're speaking to uh, potential customers or like existing customers, is people have this misconception that just because the API has been delivered, it's good at that point. And that's actually just the start of things. Because don't forget, like an API, is, as Mafon was saying, is a, it's a direct pipe to a lot of data and information that's always changing. And the API might not always be delivering it correctly. And that's a critical need. That's something you need to be constantly tracking. So when we look at delivering an API, there's really like there's three key factors into what you're looking to achieve at, from our perspective, from like testing and monitoring. And that's like you want to achieve quality. You want the thing to work, obviously. Security is actually a large issue, but it's a large issue because people aren't considering it the right way so that so in reality, like 95 percent of like security issues is are actually human error or functional errors. Like when people talk about all these hacks and stuff, it sounds cool, but usually it's just something just poorly done and delivered that way. And I'll, I'll go through a few examples later. Then the last one is reliability. You, know, you wanna make sure it's not only up, but up and working. And so internally we have, we, are, we don't just say uptime, we say functional uptime. And that's like a large differentiator and that's something that's evolving in the, in the marketplace because people are realizing that just pinging an API is not doing enough and so you'll even see like monitoring platforms are trying to add API testing, but they're calling it synthetic testing. And it's not nearly enough while you should just be using your existing like API testing process as the monitoring. And so let me sort of go into that uh, specifically a little bit more. So like how do you achieve those three things? It's at the core of everything you do, functional testing and integration testing. So that's also like end-to-end -end testing. Those should be the core of your testing as part of your delivery, but also of your monitoring and your performance testing. So very specifically, like what you're building to use for functional testing should also be your monitor, not just run as part of like your execution. 
And that's an important differentiation that's not focused on enough at large enterprises. Because large enterprises, you have a lot of silos. And what they might do is silo off monitoring to a different team. Well, I'm telling you, like that team is only doing ping tests or synthetic monitoring. They're not using what they should be doing. Like the, whoever's in charge of the API should also be in charge of the monitoring of it and the testing of it. So let me dive into a little bit of what is actually like a, a good functional test. And so what's important to note about APIs is that it's almost like a book. It's a lot of data delivered in a specific way and you have to proofread that book. So it's you not only just checking that the status code is you know 200, you wanna make sure that every single object is there as expected and it's the business logic of it. So one step further than just making, a, making sure like a number is there when it should be there, whether it's a, a float or a whole number or whatever, beyond just that, what if it's like the price of something? So uh, an example I like to use is when you're talking about like sizes. So when you work for, if you're a large e-commerce company and you, you do a search and you just do a search and like you might have a bunch of different types of objects that all have sizes. So like shoes versus pants, but the range of sizes is different. So your test should be smart enough to differentiate. If it's a pair of shoes, the sizes are two to 12. If it's a pair of pants, it's 28 to 48 or whatever it might be. Like that differentiation, is a level worth putting on your API test because that also captures a lot of other stuff. So let me give you one example of a, a customer we had. They were a large book publisher. And so what was interesting about them is that they already had internal monitoring, they thought. And so then they brought us in. And so what we did is we actually, they had two partner APIs. One of them gave you a list of all the products. The other API allowed you to dive into each of those products individually. But what we did is we created a monitor that tests both of those together. So first we get the API with all the list of products, the ISBNs, we got that list, then use that as the data to feed our next call. And so what that was doing is then out of, you know, we get a result of like a thousand products. We took 200 of them randomly, dove into each one of those individually. And what we were finding was that every two weeks on a Monday morning for about three hours, there are hundreds of errors. Long story short, what we found out was that they refresh their database every Monday in the morning. The problem was they were using their API manager and caching the endpoint, which is a good idea for performance reasons. So their product listing was cached and it had old data for two hours every morning. And they were getting complaints from their partners saying like something wasn't working right yesterday, but they didn't actually have the information. So like the partners didn't know what was happening fully and they, the, the book publisher had no idea what was happening. And we caught that because what we did is, again, we put the functional and integration test as the core of monitoring. So that, and so they're also using those tests automatically as part of the deployments as well. So it's one suite of tests used for everything, even performance testing. So they've brought it all across. Like they started using us simply because they want to do double checking their SLAs on their partner API. Then they realized like these exact same things should be used as part of the delivery process. So if we sort of like dive into it a little bit more, like, if, so if we were to take an e-commerce store, for example, first thing you do is you create a functional test so let's say again an e-commerce store you type you do a search for like the the color red and you get all of these products and they're different types of products you create a test that validates all of these including the business logic that i was telling you about about like the size differences and like you know maybe quantity should be greater than zero because you don't want to list products or out of stock if that's a rule within the company so those sorts of things count as your functional test and then the next step is you use that functional test and you'll, you'll make another call that might dive into those products individually. Put those together and that's one test. So don't just be hitting one endpoint at a time. You should be using APIs as the source of your data. Because the things we're seeing today are people are still sort of committing themselves to, to using a bit of an antiquated theory of testing whereby they're using like CSVs. So we have the CSV of 40 things and we just run it that way. We actually had a kind of customer we were talking to what they were doing was they would make this 10 same API calls on production that they would do on staging. And if they got the same results, they would push that version live. Like that's what they were calling API testing. And that's the sort of thing where you don't catch what I was talking about earlier with the book publisher, whereby they had complete outages for multiple hours a day on their partner API, which was pivotal to their business because they had completely shifted to like online. They, they had given, gotten rid of their stores. And so it's just, it's a really critical thing to consider of, connecting those things. So like, you know, search, add to cart and check out. That is a consumer flow. 
that's like your average, you know, for, for your Macy's or something. That's how they work. Why isn't that one test? You should be writing tests that reproduce your most common user flows and then make, write more tests going for the edge cases as well. But like the core of it has to be the entire reproduction of what an API consumer uses in one test. And then the key to all of this is that's really smart test you've created. You'll have you know hundreds of them. Use that, not just for your delivery and as part of your CI, delivering and autom automating the testing. That should be your monitor as well. Like don't rely on the monitoring team because they're not in capable, they're not trained to know what the API should be doing at the fundamental level that people on this call are. If you're using WSO2 or you're interested in WSO2, you're an API builder. You're the only one that really knows how it should be delivered, and it should be at the core of performance testing, functional testing, and monitoring. It should be at the core of all those three things. Those same tests should power all of that. You shouldn't have that differentiated because then you're you're losing that knowledge, that domain knowledge, when you're trying to say like, well, I'm going to do load testing in JMeter, but then I'll use something totally different to do functional testing, and then the monitoring will use Datadog. Those are three completely different systems, and only one is hopefully doing it, doing something well, but it's not being used for the monitoring, and it's probably not being used for the performance testing. Like you should be performance testing entire user flows, not just pinging an API a bunch of times, hoping to catch a memory leak. The really important aspect to all this is, you know, the way people, the thing that really scares people is security, like vulnerabilities. And so like on our blog, we go into detail about these three hacks, but they're not hacks at all. Like these are th three huge vulnerabilities uh, that was just error. So Twitter created an API that had no throttling. So that allowed people to find private information on thousands of people. It was actually a, another country. It was a country in Asia somewhere. We're just finding people's personal emails. Uh, India accidentally put an API live public that shouldn't have been live and it had no throttling, so everyone could keep hitting it. And then the United States Postal Service allowed, allowed you to search by wildcard. So instead of just getting your information, you're able to get everyone's information because a wildcard is sort of the everything. So like they didn't have tests, they weren't testing throttling, they weren't testing wildcards. Like they, these are just basic tests that should be delivered, not just as part of the delivery, but don't forget, you should be using that same stuff as your monitor. Because as we saw with like the, the book publisher, we caught that not as part of the delivery, but as part of the monitor, because the data is different in the public domain. Like your production data is different, and that could be at the core of what's causing the issue. So again, just to summarize, like one set of tests used for everything and then used across the organization. Like one big issue we see today is that people are sort of siloing. One team of five has one tester with them and they'll build an API and then they'll have one tester testing it in his own method or her own method. While then the other team, she's doing something totally different to test it. Well, then as an organization top down, how do you know if the whole thing is working? Don't forget, like when you're creating these tests and reproducing user flows, you shouldn't like a lot of times people say like, well, the developer should write a test. Well, they're going to write the test for their endpoint. But what about all the endpoints connected? That goes across a bunch of different teams. Like as I was saying, reproducing consumer flow. That's why you need like an actual real QA, someone that'll commit themselves to building a test that goes through search, add to cart, checkout, for example goes through all of that and builds one super test for that and then uses it for performance monitoring and as part of automation. So I know sort of went through that pretty quick, but that's the basis of it for me. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen because I think now it's QA time, Q&A time. How do I stop sharing the screen? Did I do it? Did I stop sharing the screen properly? Uh, it's It still shows up, but uh, sure. yeah, okay, you, you've done it, yeah. All right, there it is. Oh, it shows up again now? No, you closed it. Come on now. No. Now I stopped it. Now it should be stopped. Back to you. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, for some reason, I still see the screen. Uh, it's on the uh, build report test monitor page. Uh, but but that, that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah. So, th thanks, Patrick. That was really interesting. Yeah, so now it just disappeared. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just slow. Uh, yeah, so there is a few questions, uh, some some housekeeping questions again. Uh, so will a recording be uh, shared? Yes. Uh, so as we mentioned initially, we'll share the recording uh, and the slides uh, and, and give us like around 24 hours by 
this time tomorrow we should be able to have those ready uh, for you. Uh, there was one question on API productization. Uh, I'll just read the question out. Uh, how much focus is required from a business strategy perspective? Uh, all companies start with an API management program from the technical side, transitioning to business. Business focus lacks most of the time, especially in Middle East or Asian markets, resulting in failure of API strategy. Uh, let, let me go first and then I'll ask Patrick to jump in as well. Uh, yes, so this is a, a key factor we've seen for failed API management projects and platforms. Uh, I recently worked with one platform which has been around for like six years now. Uh, they shut down the platform recently. Uh, the main reason for that is because they started off as a, as a technology platform. So, so there was an API buzzwords. Everyone thought that you need to expose APIs. But there was no sustainable or there was no sustainability around that. There was no marketplace concept. So there was there wasn't a concept of people actually taking those APIs and starting to look at how new applications can be built around those APIs. Nor was there a concept of actually trying to increase the number of published APIs or increased reuse. Uh, often it became the case where some development teams who didn't believe in the platform would just bypass the platform because it's it's much easier maybe to just write uh, via the APIs directly instead of going through the platform. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is that or was that because the business didn't really believe in the APIs or there was no business vision or business strategy around the APIs. You can have a model where you start off uh, with a technology strategy and then move on to a business strategy, which works as well uh, because you have to prove yourself first. Uh, but then in some organizations who, who start with the uh, API strategy first, map it to their business requirements and then look at the technology part of it, that, that's, a, that's a much more successful uh, model. Uh, Patrick, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's uh, really been interesting for us is that in the past few years, we're seeing more and more people sort of focus on APIs. But what's been interesting is that they're sort of backing into it. So they're trying to like add APIs on top of stuff that exists, doesn't exist very well. And so one thing that one thing that needs to be kept track of is the path they're going down, like the goal, ultimately, because what we're seeing is people are spending a lot of time instead of just building something really strong at the core they're just sort of creating a band-aid and that band-aid eventually like won't stop the bleeding entirely so it's important to just make sure you make the teams make large decisions do we should we just commit two months to building this thing well or one week to not building it as well and it's it's the same thing like it's on a smaller scale we see it with api testing all the time people commit themselves to be like all right we, you know we're hitting the apis and postman great all right we'll write a couple tests in postman problem is after a while they've committed themselves to postman for a little while and they realize like we built a lot of mediocre tests and we this doesn't work anymore for us like we just can't think this is actually like we're not monitoring with this it's not executing as part of a ci flow like what do we do and so they're they're sort of stuck because they're like crap we need to rebuild all of this instead of they should have just taken the decision earlier on hey what are we going to do for testing and then committed themselves to one thing because if one person's in postman one person's in api fortress another person's in soap ui you haven't gotten anywhere because if that person leaves all their tests the new person you hire to replace them might disappear or might not be useful anymore so that's a that's a problem also some people are asking about we will have uh, the, sh the, the slides and the video to share after, after the call. Uh, WSA2 team, my team will take care of that. Uh, there's another question, uh, API products. So API products are a result of change management based on CRs or separate track for strategic products. Uh, so uh, again, uh, what, what we see is that you, you design your API products or you design your APIs, you package them as products, which means there are different tenants associated with it. And those products itself need to change over time. Any API can, can be subject to change. Uh, you, so, so basically you need to have a change management process as part of publishing your APIs, as part of versioning your APIs, uh, you need to have a feedback process. So that's, that's what we said uh, as part of uh, the API products and change management. Uh, again, uh, Patrick, feel free to jump in. I'm just running through the questions that are here. Yeah, I see one uh, that's yes. tools other than Soap UI and Postman. Uh, well, I mean, there, there's API Fortress, that's us. There's also other people in the space like Parasoft, uh, Blaze Me to run Scope is okay. They don't do as much for CI CD stuff. Uh, one thing to 
keep track of. Like, don't forget, like if you have a team you really want to dedicate to building it internally, you can do that as well. There's open source tools out there like REST. One thing I do want to make sure people are mindful of is don't try to do API testing with Cucumber. There are frameworks to try to do it, but it's actually very problematic. And you'll find yourselves spending a lot of time. And then at the end, you realize this wasn't good enough and I need to start over in something else. So I would just be, be weary of uh, using Cucumber. But again, my Postman, SOAP UI, API Fortress, Parasoft, BlazeMeter, there's a few of us out there. Uh, Patrick, there was another question asking whether uh, there are other tools other than SOAP UI or Postman. I'm guessing you answered that as well. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, there, there are some simpler questions. Uh, I'll start from the bottom. Is WSO2, does WSO2 support multi tenancy? Yes. Uh, both as a shared tenancy model or as a container based uh, native tenancy, like independent containers. Uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Uh, how do you, okay, so how do you measure the size of an API gateway? Uh, is the peak risk request per second a good measure? Do you consider 1,000 requests per second a large API gateway? Uh, yes, so 1,000 requests per second is a large API gateway. If you if you think of uh, that uh, uniformly throughout a day, which is like 24 hours, or you need to look at an eight-hour day, business hour a day, uh, we have worked with deployments which are like one request per second or, or 10 requests per second, uh, which I think one request per second translates to like around roughly 100,000 requests per day, right? So which is which is a big amount as well. But we have also worked with deployments which is like 100,000 requests per second to 400,000 requests per second to 15 billion requests per day, etc. So it varies. I think you need to look at the average, the peak, uh, and and then the message size uh, as well. Uh, another now, question. One, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I I had a question too that someone just paying me directly with. Uh, APIs sometimes often are it's like a, it's like an iceberg. They're all like behind like your firewall. So one thing you want to keep track of when we're talking about like doing all of this, all of this like using functional testing and monitoring is to be mindful of how you have access. So when you're doing monitoring and you're considering using like that's the questions around like using like a third party tool. You have to be mindful of are you going to have to whitelist their IPs to go through your firewall or are you just going to look to deploy something internally behind the firewall? So those are things to keep track of because like with Postman and BlazeMeter, you'll be doing monitoring. You have to use their servers. API Fortress, we're unique in that we're containerized. So we give you the container and you deploy it entirely internally. Uh, we have a SaaS model as well, but like the, the majority of the our uniqueness and where people are really using us is deploying it internally then deploying it across the organization to track all of their internal APIs. Because don't forget, like you might have like one partner API, but you probably have 10 internal APIs way before that that are just feeding like your internal tools. So that's a, that's an, that is that's that that a good point. Someone just pinged me on like, you have to be, you have to keep track of the tool and what their capabilities are to do monitoring internally and what, that, what that'll take. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Patrick. Uh, another quick question: API first model challenges you face is most of the time we have limited backend capabilities. So yes, that is a problem. Uh, but then that's that's uh, that's one way of designing good APIs. You you start with the real business problem at hand without looking at what your actual data is, then try to figure out whether you have the data to map to that API. So it is a, it is one way of designing good APIs. Of course, it'll result in you doing more work as well. A direct monetization, does this actually exist uh, in, in practice? Yes, actually, there are a few organizations that charge, that have a free API, but then you charge more if you need unlimited access to that API, like even Google Maps, right? You have a limited access to the API, but you can go for an enterprise version of Google Earth and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so many organizations do this. The, another model is an indirect uh, monetization where you don't charge for the API itself, but then you charge, like let's say there are different channels, and if you want a mobile channel that accesses the API, you charge with that channel. And so there are indirect ways of uh, doing this as well. Uh, Someone's asking tools? about yeah. uh, tools, testing automation. I mean, obviously it's we're API Fortress, uh, but if you're looking to do, if you're looking to if you can't like buy a tool, some companies just want to go open source and build it themselves. There's a few different libraries out there that are that are interesting. Uh, one of the one of the ones we see often used is Rest Assured. So that's a Java-based library. That's that's pretty good for some people. 
Uh, also, if you're looking to stick with like open source, SOAP UI has an open source version, and there's an open source tool that's kind of fun and new called Postwoman, because Postman's not open source, it's it's free with a freemium model, but Postwoman's actually an open source version that somebody's been building. So that's really, really fun to play with as well. Some other people have tried to use JMeter as the root of their like testing. Uh, that ends up being very problematic, especially when you're looking at, you know, multi-step tests or using APIs as the data for your test. It ends up being more problems than it, it causes more problems than it solves ultimately. Uh, but if you're looking to just do open source stuff, there's SOAP UI open source, but ultimately I think I would just use it rest assured. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Uh, another question, uh, does, does WDS support API customization? Where do I write that? So you can actually customize the API itself because the API is actually a customized version per customer. So you can have APIs for different types of customers, package them for different types of users. Uh, if you need to customize the whole gateway itself, you can go and write handlers in, in there as well. Uh, but yes, that's that's the configuration part of it. Uh, what do you think of TM Forum Open APIs? So that's one specific API standard, similar to Open Banking, PSD2, the healthcare standards. Uh, we had a GSMA1 API for telcos as well. So this is another telco standard. Uh, yes, there are different standards that come up and you can we can support those uh, standards as well. Uh, I think, Patrick, that's, oh no, there's more questions coming in. I guess we'll take a couple of minutes. Uh, for the rest of the questions, we'll we'll respond to these offline, and and then we can send this as part of the uh, map package itself. For microservices architecture, single page application called yeah through the API gateway directly the service mesh. Uh, again, this is a this is a, a like area which uh, has a lot of discussions going on around it. As long as the gateway is lightweight and it's not additional adding a lot of hops, and the actually the trade off is good enough, you need to use a gateway. But then again, you need to look at the trade-offs of what you achieve by using a gateway, not just the sake of having a gateway uh, uh, because it's there. Right? So uh, we, we'll send some resources around that as well. Uh, I'm guessing, Patrick, because we are at the top of the hour, uh, we can call this a day. This has been a really useful presentation. It was uh, really nice to hear the testing cases as well. And, and again, in my experience, I've seen uh, a severe lack of testing on the API front, and that has led to a lot of failed actual APIs, actual endpoints being hit. Uh, so, so thanks again, Patrick. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, and, and we'll be again, as we mentioned, we'll share all this, the slides, and we'll also compile a set of responses if that's possible and send that across as well. Uh, Patrick, closing thoughts from you? Uh, just What's been interesting is that there's been an evolution in sort of testing with CI specifically. So CI came around, people decided, oh, we should automate the testing. Now CI is being used so often, they could be doing 100 deliveries a day. Well, if you're doing 100 automated tests a day, that's sort of monitoring at that point. And that's why I've been pushing this, this thing of like your functional and integration tests are going to become your monitors. That's the way everyone's going. It should be not only part of your automated flow, it should be your monitors and you should be monitoring production. So just be mindful of that and make a decision that will work for that all the way through because that's where things are going. So if you make that decision now in five years, you won't find yourself having to, to redo things. But anyway, I appreciate it. It was very interesting. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm Patrick at API Fortress. And then, uh, or you could ping Will at API Fortress. All right. Thank you, everyone. And again, Mefan at WS2. And, and yeah, you, you have the contact details on the slide deck as well. Thank you and have a great day. Bye everyone.